So I'm just going to introduce our guest. So like I said, his name is Tom Fitzmorris, and this is his very beautiful book. It is his debut novel, which um, I'm currently reading and I'm loving. I don't want to put it down. Uh, so it's called Cans, Coffee and Kimonos, a memoir of four years living and teaching in Japan. So the blurbs there, but I'll just tell you a bit about it. So this is Tom Fitzmaurice's memoir of the four years he spent living and teaching in Tokyo, the biggest city on earth. A young man from England's rural, rural West country, he was thrust into a new world for which he was completely unprepared and which he found utterly bewildering. Tom gives an insight into the life of an English teacher in this most fascinating of countries and how he found his feet teaching students aged two to 91. From sitting in a robot restaurant, watching a giant metal triceratops firing multicolored laser beams to the quietude of secluded and ancient mountaintop shrines on remote Japanese islands. This is a story of coming of age in a beguiling metropolis of culture, shock, faux pas, joy, hilarity, horror, and the steepest of learning curves. Earthquakes, hedgehog cafes, bathing with the Yakuza, love hotels, typhoons, geisha, nuclear fallout, fascists, festivals, temples, bullet trains, karaoke, Samurai Swords, Sushi and Sumo, this memoir, memoir has it all. How exciting. And that was very difficult to read out loud. <laughs> but yes, very exciting. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, just letting Tom you know, tell us, tell us you know, why Japan? How did you find yourself there? Thank you. Um, complete, well, the answer to your question is completely by accident. Uh, I was 23. Um, I, I was yeah, a young 23 year old man living in Wiltshire, uh, having finished university not long before. And I was in search of, of some adventure, really. Uh, I wanted to do something exciting in uh, a far, a far flung place. And I'd initially set my heart on, I thought China might be a good place to go. It sounded very exciting, very different. And uh, I turned up for the interview in London and uh, I was successful. And the chap who was interviewing me said, well, look, you know, our language school, we have branches in China, Taiwan, Japan, Poland, all over the place. And uh, he said, where would you like to go? And I said, China. And he said, well, I just want to say, he said, I taught in Japan and Vietnam um, and Taiwan and China. And he said, I actually enjoyed Japan the most and I said oh really um, and I took back my application form off him crossed out the word China and thought well that's as good a, a recommendation as any wrote the word Japan and then three weeks later I was uh, I was living in Tokyo that's amazing yeah I was I was surprised at how quickly it all happened it did yeah really quickly that was quite quite a whirlwind sort of shock really yeah, it's very, very brave. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if it's brave. I think it's just more the case that I would trick myself into, I, I think I'm a bit like this. I force myself to do things and then deal with the consequences later because you don't really have to be brave until you you land at the airport in Japan. You think, oh, right, I, I'm actually doing this, you know. So uh, that, that's the sort of way I kind of overcome my fears, I suppose. Okay. You don't think about it till you get there and then, and then it hits you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of just bank on the fact that I'm going to at some point develop the courage at the time and hope that I do. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's amazing. And so tell us about, you know, tell us about your, your first impressions of Japan. What were you thinking when you when you stepped off the plane? Oh, gosh, um, I was absolutely bewildered. Uh, I, I'd been on this uh, plane with five or six other teachers from England, uh, these young ladies and men. And I thought, great, we've got this little friendship group here and I'll cling to these people and, and they seem to know more than me and they can speak a bit of the language and I'll rely on them to help me through it. And then we got through to the arrivals lounge in uh, the airport in Tokyo. And they said, all oh, right, you know, this is Mike. Right, Mike, you're going to this part of Japan. And oh, what's your name, Laura? Right, Laura, you're going to Osaka or whatever. And then, they went off in groups of twos and threes 
and then I was the last one and they said oh right okay so you're Tom you're coming with you're coming with me this lady said we're going to Tokyo and I was I was all alone I thought oh no so oh. <laughs> off through the city streets at rush hour um from the airport through to the train stations at rush hour in Tokyo and it was just absolutely bamboozling so Oh, gosh, I love your description of how, you know, there was this woman and you were just trying to follow her and not lose her. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get through the crowds with your suitcase and, and just yeah. not knowing where you were going. I mean, yeah, it was it was absolutely mind boggling, really. And I, for that first sort of, well, I suppose the first few months really almost felt like a case of just survival and, and trying to to get settled in really before. And then I started to relax and obviously enjoy it a lot more. Oh, okay. Well, that's, wow, very, very interesting start. And, um, you know, did you, because there was this part where you said, you know, hopefully you'll settle in soon, but you weren't sure if you'd ever settle in. Um, so did you settle in and start enjoying some, you know, some parts of Japan? And, and can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it took me a few months to, to really sort of bed in and enjoy it. And there were two parts really to, I think, to the experience of being there. One was simply living, living in Japan, living in Tokyo. Um, and I mean, Tokyo is a, a, a wild, a wild in the sense of its scale, because it's got um, 30, depending on which definition you read, somewhere between 36 and 38 million um people in the greater Tokyo area. Um, so population wise, it's sort of give or take three to three and a half times the size of London. Um, so living in Tokyo itself is an interesting thing to get used to. And then there was the second part, which was, you know, learning to become an English teacher and meeting all of my students as well. So, so that. Yeah. So a lot, lot to adjust to. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. L lots to, lots to yeah. get definitely and you mentioned one of your favorite things to do was visit the onsens um can you tell us oh, a bit yeah. about that oh absolutely actually um i've got a bit in here sorry i don't have the page ready but oh, i oh great yeah if you can read quickly. some that would be so wonderful while i'm just flicking through to find that that page um yeah onsen is the japanese word which means um uh hot springs baths so there, there's two things really that are, are quite similar so um, there's the sento, which are the public public baths, and then there's the um, onsen, which are like hot springs, um, and they're kind of similar. I mean, the obvious difference being that um, uh, sento are, you know, tr I suppose possibly a bit like other countries, um, maybe even a bit like parts of England a long time ago. You wouldn't have had a, a bath in the house. Um, so people would have communal baths and there'd be the bath house for each neighborhood or a couple in each neighborhood. So I, I like that because it's got that kind of real traditional thing going on. But I'll just read you a bit. Um, yes. This is from chapter four. So the title of the chapter is uh, chapter four, the biggest city on earth living in Tokyo. And the bit I'm going to read you is, is actually the last part of chapter four. Um, and in the earlier part, I've talked about you know, uh, the festivals and the food and the trains. And then I finished the chapter just by talking about um, the, the, the onsens. So here we go. Seeing new things was all well and good, but I discovered a new way to spend my free time, which was far more immersive. My favorite thing to do in Japan is to take a hot spring bath. Onsen is a popular Japanese pastime that dates back centuries. All across the volcanic archipelago, hot spring water bubbles up through the ground. Spas have been built on these sites for centuries, and some of them are truly a sight to behold. There's a place in Tokyo called King of Onsen. For roughly 15 pounds, you can spend as long as you like, enjoying a whole range of baths and other facilities. Upstairs, the spa is divided into separate men's and women's sections. You're given a bag containing several towels of various sizes and a robe that you can wear as you wander around the facility. At the front desk, as you enter, you're given an ele electronic fob to wear around your wrist. This is scanned as you leave to assess which of the facilities you've used and what you've bought from the restaurant and the various vending machines. As with all Japanese public baths and spas, before you bathe, you must first scrub yourself clean at one of the wash stations that line the wall. Once you're sparkling clean, you can enjoy the facilities without the thought that you're wallowing in other people's filth. 
The range of baths and other options on offer is simply breathtaking. There's the standard warm bath, the hot bath, the very hot bath, there's the hot milky bath and the hot bubble bath. There's the electric bath. Yes, you read that right. It sends electric pulses through the water to relax the muscles, which I needed a not insignificant amount of coaxing to try for the first time. Then there are the herbal baths, over the sides of which hang nets of what look to be tea leaves. There are also the mineral baths, which give off a brown rusty colour and smell of sulphur. And there are the cold baths too. Next to the cold baths is a row of stone seats. Hot water constantly cascades from above your head. I don't know what's more unnerving about sitting on these stone benches like some kind of naked wet Caesar. The fact that the hot water cascading down your neck and back and then your legs creates the sensation that you're going to the loo, or that you sit there on your elevated throne displaying your naked self to everyone sitting in the hot milky bath. There's a sauna with an inbuilt TV playing baseball games on a loop, and there's a steam room. In an outdoor area, there are large hot slabs of slate that you lie on, which are so hot they're just about bearable. It feels a bit odd at first, lying completely naked on a huge hot rock in front of lots of other men lying completely naked on hot rocks all around you, but it is in fact incredibly relaxing. Next to this, there are a series of individual tiled areas with a couple of inches of hot water running across them. You can lie there comfortably and enjoy the sunshine or the breeze through the bamboo roof. Downstairs in the mixed section in your dressing gown, you can meet up once more with your partner and enjoy a selection of four steam rooms. There's 50 degrees, 90 degrees, five degrees and menthol. Then there are five separate rooms filled with hot pebbles on which you can lie in your robe with a small pillow. Once again, you have menthol, warm, hot, very hot. And why the hell would you want anything that hot? In the communal area outside these rooms, people lounge on massage chairs and watch more baseball. There's an area where you can have your feet nibbled on by little fish, a masseuse, a restaurant and countless vending machines. On several occasions I've been to King of Onsen, intending to stay for an hour or so, and walked out three and a half hours later. I felt great, but I must have made a strange sight to the locals each time I left there, as this light-headed but incredibly relaxed white man wafted off into the Tokyo night like a deflated balloon barely in control of his trajectory. (laughs) Oh god, it sounds sounds both (laughs) terrifying and amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, it just makes me laugh, especially just picturing, you know, sitting, sitting there. <laughs> it's, it's, the, yeah. yeah, it's rather unnerving because we're very abashed in this country about, you know, um, you know, taking your clothes off in public. And so this sort of very prudish British man sitting there, <laughs> um, you know, uh, surrounded by pretty much solely middle aged Japanese men. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's a rather interesting <laughs> Yep, I can I can imagine, but I mean, it, you you obviously enjoyed it. You said you said you spent hours there, and oh, it was it was very relaxing. Loved it. I it, if somebody said to me what you know, pick one thing that I like most about Japan. I mean, a close second would be the food, but I love the hot springs. It's so relaxing. Ah, good tip. Good to know. <laughs> um, so, it's a, would you say it's a must do while in Japan? Absolutely absolutely um and the great thing is they are everywhere so um even a lot of the hotels you stay at they will have like a hot springs complex but um whether you're in the middle of the countryside in a sort of resort in the mountains or whether you're in the middle of tokyo or osaka there are are places you can go yeah oh that's fantastic and (laughs) while you're while you're speaking about the different regions i mean there's um did you have much time to travel around um I'm sure you know you might have mentioned this in the book, but um, where what places would you recommend? I mean, it's there's so many places to see. If if someone say had limited time, let's yeah. say your your top three favorite places to go. Ooh, top three. So I mean, obviously Tokyo would have to be in there. Um, Kyoto. I I mean Kyoto is um, I I don't know. Kyoto is to Japan what say. Florence or Venice is to Italy. Um, it's or Barcelona is to Spain. It's the sort of cultural um, or the historic uh, hub of Japan. So, if you're after, you know, you can see geisha walking in their wooden clogs in their kimono down old cobbled streets. You've got your 
built your old wooden buildings, your paper lantern streets, your little streams and your vermilion bridges. The city is, it, it's got the pagodas and the temple, mm-hmm. the, the old kabuki theatre and the tea ceremonies and the ponds of carp. So Kyoto is almost um, the antithesis of Tokyo in a sense, perhaps Tokyo or Osaka represent that ultra modern Japan, that kind of flashing neon, uh, uber high tech that we, we think of in, in, in when we think of Japan in one respect. And Kyoto is that kind of old Japan we think of in another. So, yeah, definitely Kyoto. Um, but I mean, funnily enough, it, it's, you know, even though Kyoto is very old, well, weldy, um, it is still quite a big city. You know, it, it's still the size of by population like Birmingham, but it's still got that historic nature. So definitely Kyoto. Um, and I'm quite a fan of um, Shikoku, which is one of the four islands. Um, it's the smallest of the four islands. And um, I write about in the book, there's this hidden valley, which was virtually inaccessible until the 20th century called the Ia Valley. Um, and it is just breathtaking. Turquoise rivers, um, it, it's real, you know, misty valleys. Uh, it, it just seems to be untucked. It, it could be from centuries past. Um, and it, it's it's just absolutely gorgeous. So like a rural paradise. So I would say Kyoto, if you can visit rural Shikoku Island, uh, the Ia Valley is gorgeous. And I would also say, um, oh, it's tricky to, to just <laughs> just to choose three. The same yeah. Um, I would have to say Kanazawa, which is about a third the size of Kyoto. It's very much like Kyoto, but Kanazawa is famous as an old uh, samurai city. So if you go and if you've got an interest in things that are samurai related or even ninja, they've got the old ninja castle with the kind of floor, the walls that will spin you around and things. And it's it's fascinating. Um, but there's so many, I mean, Hiroshima as well, uh, or Nagasaki were fascinating. Um, uh, obviously, historically, um, to, you know, you go there, obviously, in a very different frame of mind. Yeah. Um, but, you know, fascinating to go there. And the, I, I, I don't want to harp on and on because I could just go on for hours, but <laughs> we'll also say the North as well, because it is often deemed in Japan that uh, the true kind of wild or untrammeled or, or the last frontier is really the North of Japan. Um, so, you know, those Northern prefectures, um, Aomori, Akita, Iwate, and then the far North Island of Hokkaido. So you have some, you know, bear, you, you, can, you can come across bears in the forest. It's really as wild as, say, I don't know, um, perhaps we don't have anywhere in Britain quite that wild. <laughs> Too many places to choose from. Oh, wow. It sounds amazing. I mean, I've been a couple of times and I feel like I haven't scratched the surface after hearing yeah. you speak about all these places. Yeah, you, um, could, you could live there for 10 years and still not scratch the surface, so... Oh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. well, it's definitely, um, you know, the old saying something for everyone, but I definitely yeah. think it's it's one of those places where you can go and just, you know, have something there for, yeah. for everyone's um, style of travel. Definitely. Um, wow. Um, how lucky were you to live there for four years? That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Very yeah. lucky indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to um, delve into a bit about why you wrote this book or what what got oh. you started what made you write this book mm. sorry just taking a gulp of tea oh, no problem <laughs> um i uh, it's, it sounds odd because a lot of the answers to my questions are going to be i didn't intend to do this or this wasn't supposed <laughs> to happen. but you know um last spring late spring so we're talking april may last year obviously <laughs> the world situation was uh changing very quickly um, with with lockdown uh, um, and and I had suddenly a certain amount of free time on my hands. Um, I'm I'm a I'm a, a, a supply a primary school supply teacher, and obviously primary schools were closed for several months uh, in the UK and elsewhere. And I decided that it would be nice because I've got a really bad memory. 
my mum had been talking about writing stuff down because she said, when I'm gone, I want you to know some of the stuff about my childhood. And if I don't write it down, uh, you know, I'll forget to tell you, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, I thought of myself and I thought, well, I'm starting to forget because it had been 10 or nine years then since I left Japan. I thought I'm starting to forget some of the interesting or funny things that happened to me. And so she'd kind of inspired me. I thought, well, I'm going to write down what I did in Japan because I'll do it while it's still relatively fresh. And when I'm old, um, you know, people's, you know, my nieces or nephews um, will be able to read about the things that I did. And I didn't intend to make a book out of it. It was for me to read for posterity or for members of my family to read it. Um, and then I started writing it and I got to a certain point. I thought, do you know, will other people find this funny? I think it's quite funny or, or this is quite interesting. And then the idea started to germinate. Could I actually make a book out of this? Okay. Uh, so it kind of happened by accident. Oh, really. that's great. Um, <laughs> and just another technical question about writing. Um, yeah. So um, did you find that you changed your style of writing at all when, when you switched in your mind from writing it for yourself to writing it for an audience? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Because, and I mean, even in something as subtle as the idea that, you know, I might allude to something, but I'd always know the innermost details of it. Well, <laughs> your audience won't. So, so you really have to flesh it out. Um, but, you know, but that said, I didn't, you know, that said, I didn't write it in a manner in which I thought this will come across well. I wrote it as if I was down the pub telling a mate um so because I, I kind of think you should write the way you speak or the way you think mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of writers who are much more experienced than me might say rubbish but that I don't know that that strikes me as being true and, and and for the reason that when I read people read other people's memoirs you know whether it's an explorer or I like reading books that are that are written in the style of that kind of spoken or, or in a style of thought do you know what I mean yeah yeah I do know what you mean and one of my favorites Bill Bryson he he writes like that um yeah. I don't know who inspires you in terms of travel writing oh gosh I mean <laughs> Bill Bryson um is I haven't read any Bryson for 20 years not because he's not good we st I studied Bryson for a level at notes from a small island okay really funny brilliant writer um, and there's lots of other writers who I love. Probably the best memoir I've ever read um, is a book by a guy that was in the army called Patrick Hennessy, um, the Junior Officers Reading Club. Okay. That was a fantastic memoir. I mean, I'm just picking one because there's there's loads yeah. of memoirs I like. Um, but yeah, so Bill Bryson's brilliant. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, other people that have written about Japan as well. Um, there's a guy called Will Ferguson, who's done one called Hokkaido Highway Blues, which is possibly one of the best books I've ever read on Japan. If you okay. look to read about Japan, I would recommend. And Alan Booth, who is, I, I'm going to stick my neck out on this one and say Alan Booth has written the best books on Japan that I've read, um, whether that be from a Japanese person or from a he, he sadly he's dead now but he was a, a guy from London that moved to Japan at the age of 20 in 1970 and he lived okay. until his untimely death at the age in his early 40s and he walked the 2000 mile journey from the northernmost tip to the southernmost tip and wrote a book about it and he did lots of other books and just fantastic so, oh, that's incredible. Oh, yeah. well, they definitely have some more on my list for when yeah. I finish this one. And it'd be interesting to compare the, you know, the difference in the in the time periods and um, sounds like yeah. a different journey. But yeah, I know I agree with you with what you said about just I, I enjoy reading memoirs that are written as you would be speaking um, to someone at the pub. And I, I did get that did come across in your in your book. I didn't I, yeah. you know, you, you were just telling me about it, really. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, that's uh, salt. There's so much to talk about. I feel like we, we could talk for hours, but I, I do want to leave some time for questions. Mm. Um, but I thought what we could do is um, if you have another section you'd like to Ooh, yeah. read. And that's while a, I, while Tom's doing that, if anyone has any questions, please just send them over to me and I'll ask 
I'll ask him, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna um, read a, a section. Probably my, I probably shouldn't have a favorite part of your own book. That's a bit vainglorious, isn't it? But um, uh, this is part of chapter three. So chapter three is called Tomu Sensei, Becoming a Teacher. And it's about the teaching side of things, because obviously I write about Japan, but I also do write about, you know, what it's like to be a, a teacher in Japan. So this is um, a little extract that just shows how I got used to, to the, the work routine. The school day usually lasted from 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. And so I got used to getting up late and going to bed late. Our lessons were often back to back. It was hard to go in the space of five minutes from dancing around the room like a kangaroo, throwing beach balls and playing run and touch the tiger to teaching a 60 year old company executive. Heaven forbid we should need the loo because we barely had enough time to wave little Taro goodbye, peel the magnetic flashcards off the wall, hide the puppets, pack away the plastic fruit and move the table back into the middle of the room before Mr. Sakamoto would walk, come walking in briefcase in hand. You'd better have the CD for market leader pre-intermediate teed up in the right place for the listening activity where Paul tries to negotiate a deal with Ian, which your student wouldn't understand. And you'd spend precious minutes of the lesson rewinding to play yet again, while the confused businessman asked loudly, what is Paul? The CD would inevitably jam. And it was at these moments of high tension as you desperately press the CD release button with sweaty fingers and one after the other blew, shook, and rubbed the CD with your tie to try and get the damn thing to work because Mr. Sakamoto was looking at his watch that you remembered now just how much you needed the loo. Once you'd spent the next half an hour establishing that Paul was just the name of one of the men speaking and not relevant to any of the questions on which the listening activities were based, Mr. Sakamoto would walk out happy in the knowledge that at least if he'd learned nothing else that lesson, he could use the verb to pour. Great, time for a wee, you'd think, your bladder fit to burst and get to the toilet and find it occupied because Michiko was in there and she was your next student. And by the time she got out, you'd have no time yet again because Mr. Sakamoto and the great Paul debate had overrun by five minutes. Michiko is happy because her husband's gone away for a week on business and she doesn't really like him. And now she can watch that Korean drama she loves every night. And aren't you lovely? And have you found a nice Japanese girl yet? And aren't, isn't your face small? Oh, lovely. You've got the textbook out, but Michiko doesn't want you to open it because she'd rather she sat and cooed at you and talked about your mum and, oh, what's her name? And you're secretly delighted because you hadn't the time to plan the lesson and you're far better at talking about your mum to old ladies who smile and nod and lean in to hear what you're saying than explaining that Paul is a name and not a marketing pitch. <laughs> I'll stop oh, wow. That. I, was that, that, that's hilarious. Was that, was that your first teaching experience did you um, say it's it it's not uh, sort of taken from a specific day but it's just a kind of mosaic of all, all the <laughs> all the uh, early experiences because I, I taught okay. it different schools so I, I've just kind of put it all into one you put, yeah oh I'm sure you you have a, a, so many interesting stories um was that your first teaching um job overall I think you yeah. said it was wasn't it yeah, yeah I, I, well, I'd done three weeks at a language school in Bournemouth. I, I write briefly about that in the book, actually. Yes, um, yes, I do remember now. But um, I mean, which is funny for its own be... reasons. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, the experience must have just been um, just, you know, I can't even describe it. How would you describe it? <laughs> um, excellent, wonderful, terrifying, bizarre, <laughs> everything, everything rolled into one. The students were lovely. Lovely, yeah. lovely, lovely. I can't honestly say I had any students that I, I didn't get on with, um, but it was it was such a variety. You know, you'd be teaching a, a group of five two year olds and then the chief executive of some pretty high powered company in Tokyo, you know, with with no minutes in between. So it was you had to be a kind of, I don't know, part circus juggler. You know, you had to you had to be very flexible. OK. Wow. <laughs> um, that's that's fantastic. Um, and I'm sure you learned a lot of skills you never thought you'd need. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so does anyone have any questions? I didn't see any questions come in yet. Um, but if anyone does have any questions, please don't be shy. Oh, Paul, do you Paul, who's joined us on the call, does have a question. Um, shall I unmute you, Paul? Thanks for joining us. Oh, I can't unmute you. 
Okay, I'll unmute myself then. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Sorry I joined late. I was taking a call at the time. I was fascinated. I, I was fascinated to come on to this because, um, first of all, I, I um, work part time for a travel company and um, I've traveled to Japan probably about seven or eight times in the last couple of years. I so I was I was interested to hear what what you you had to say. I think one of the questions uh, I was going to ask you because I found, how how did you cope with their their sort of work ethos over there and and the way they actually live their their their, their daily life? Oh, that's a that, 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 that they are two really good questions because um and and thank you, Paul. Um and you, you know you would have had an insight into into the very different working and luckily. We, we in my company i worked for a british company funnily enough um not long after i left the company was then taken over by japanese management so i think perhaps it would have changed but um i i felt kind of insulated from um the 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 normal japanese working life and i did have british and american friends who were working for japanese companies um but my bosses um, were Brits, Canadians, Australians. And so I was kind of a little bit insulated from Japanese working life. And I'm not going to lie, I think that's a really good thing. Uh, <laughs> because as you know well, Paul, um, you know, uh, the Japanese work ethos um, uh, is, is extremely intense. Uh, the hours that you're supposed to work, unpaid overtime, uh, extreme pressure, um, and, and, uh, I, I feel really glad that I wasn't part of that. As far as the living, to just address the second part of your question, as far as the living was concerned, again, um, you, 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 I sort of always had the feeling that I was kind of floating along in a parallel universe in yeah. the sense that um, I, I, it, 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 it's not necessarily the easiest thing to, to feel like you're part of, in, in the circle, as it were. Um, so you 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 can feel in it, but not of it, if that makes any sense. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way, um, but um, no. And, and there are privileges that perhaps I couldn't have enjoyed if I was working for a for a Japanese company, or actually, in fact, if I if I had been Japanese. So, okay, well that, that's great. My reason for asking those two questions together is that it took me some time to realise that. Um, you know their work ethos as you say is so regimented and, and yeah. um that when they have social time they go over, over the top you know they yeah. really go over the top they let you know people often say to me um you know what what japanese holidays are there and i basically say to them they'll have a holiday for any excuse so you know celebrate you know us thanksgiving yom kippur yeah. anything anything just so a they get time off and b yeah they can just go mad you know absolutely yeah absolutely bonkers. I mean, absolutely no paul i mean that's really interesting you know you know the japanese they work hard they play hard i've seen some ridiculous things i mean i i've been out and i'm sure probably paul it's the same for you you know i've been out till to six seven in the morning and you find yourself like being hugged by this group of Japanese businessmen who have made up a song about you and they've got ties around their heads. And then I had this bizarre experience where I was in a noodle bar one night with an American friend of mine from New York. And this guy who was very drunk uh, with a silver moustache, he decided that like, we were his best friends in the world and he was hugging us. And, and then he took us to all these bars around Tokyo introducing like, these are my friends. And you know, he was, he was, he was, you know, kissing us on the head and, oh you're amazing and took us to karaoke and he stood up and smashed a glass on the floor you know over the top and the next the next, actually it might not have been the next day maybe it was a few days later i bumped into him in the street middle of the day obviously he was completely sober and he was with his wife who actually he wasn't with the night before he was with a different lady so that's another story in itself and he completely blanked me and i went oh hi in japanese completely blanked me so the, the abandon, the reckless abandon and the complete hedonism. He was proclaiming I was his best friend in the universe. And then he, he completely blanked me the next, the, uh, when I next saw him. So that was quite funny. Yeah, I, I've had similar um, incidents like that as well, which I won't I won't relate now. But, um, <laughs> but no, it, it, it's interesting, you know, you saying that because I, I, I wasn't. 
I didn't have the feeling that I was the only one that, you know, thought this way. But, um, mm. you know, I remember the first time I went out and particularly in Osaka. Yeah, I, I, I just could not get my head around life in Osaka. It yes. was, um, you know, all for the young, all for the young and, and, and everything, you know. Um, you know, you go down the area by Don uh, Don Chonaburi there. Yeah. You know, and, the, and the huge shopping street is down there. Um, you, you know, it, it's absolutely bonkers. And it took me probably my third trip out there to suddenly, you know, grip it all. I mean, yeah. the, the thing that really fascinates me out there is in, in the big cities, you know, you've got some real um, amazing, you know, um, historic places to go to right next to a, a, a major shopping mall. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and um, I mean, I've, I've traveled quite a bit in Southeast Asia and people always yeah. say to me, you know, is it like Thailand? Is it like Laos? Is it like Vietnam? And I say, no, I mean, my own personal opinion, if, if you said to me, where should Japan be? I would say probably tagged on to the United States somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't well, quite know where. You that's know. really interesting you say that because I haven't actually traveled extensively in Asia, but you know, a lot of friends of mine, similar to you who have say that Japan is this strange anomaly. And I talk about this in the book. I say, um, and with regards to Japan now, as you say, this odd mix, um, but also, with regards to Japan's history. And, and you can't really look at a, a country without, you know, we're all formed by our history uh, for good and bad. And Japan is this very strange sort of, uh, you know, kind of Western, but not in the West, but sort of with many Western features, but then very not West, you know, it's very, and it's a cliche to say it, but it's very Eastern, whatever that is, um, yeah. in some regards, but, but also, as you said, it's got a lot of Western influence and it's, I think it, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, you could say this about Britain or many countries, but I think it's almost got an, an identity crisis. It doesn't quite know what it is. No, I, I would agree with you on that. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the, I think one of the um, sorry. No, go ahead, I, Paul. I think one of the, the, the most strange things, but also wonderful things was I was in Hi uh, Hiroshima quite oh, a yeah. bit. And of course, we went to the Peace Museum there. Mm. And um, one of my um, things that I do is I'm a, I'm a battlefield guide. So I was very interested in in, oh, right. in in the dropping of the atomic bomb. And you will probably know this, and please correct yeah. me if, I, if I'm wrong. But the, I, I believe that the school children of Japan are not actually taught um, why the bomb was dropped. They, they were taught that it was dropped and it was yeah. an appalling thing. It was absolutely... Um, you know, a borrowing could never happen again, but it's all about reconciliation. Yeah, now that, that's really interesting, Paul. And I, I, I'll defer to your fast. You know, given given your 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 job, I'll, I'll defer to your far superior knowledge to this one. And I'll, I'll put a disclaimer in saying that I'm definitely not an expert, but and I, I'm I'm a bit of a military geek. I love stuff like that. Um, as far as I'm aware, you are absolutely correct. Um, and you know having spoken to Japanese of, of a certain generation, that rings 100% true. Uh, and I write a little bit about this in the book about how, you know, much as any country, our imaginations are, or I, I, our ideas of ourselves are formed from our histories. And, you know, you can have what I was taught at secondary school about the Pacific theater of World War II, and it, it wouldn't tally very much with the Japanese educational experience. Now, um, you know, I, I shan't go into the, the nitty gritty of why, you know, why that is, but no, I think you're definitely right. Um, and, and I think their, their way of teaching history is very different to ours, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree on that. Yeah. Okay, I mean, yeah. I, could, I, could, I could talk to you for ages, but I'll shut up. Now. I, I, think, no, I think you two need to set up a meeting. I'm sorry, I'll, <laughs> I'll need to wrap it up in a moment, but I think that, I mean, uh, that's a, another interesting conversation, and I love it. Um, yeah, no, that's and I mean, there's so much in this book, and just, you know, with your experiences and talking about Japan as a whole, and maybe we'll set up another talk sometime, but um, I'm happy to put you two in, in touch, if that's okay, Tom. Yeah, that'd be great. Reminisce. Uh yeah. I think Tom. I think Tom. Actually, you live in the same part of the UK as I do as well. I'm yeah, in this country. I, yeah, absolutely. I do. I do. Yeah. Oh, oh great. Perfect. No, it would be good to talk more on this. No, we should. I'd love to. Get the book. Yeah. <laughs>
Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. And thanks for that question, Paul. Um, yeah. Great questions. And I wish I wish we did have more time to talk, um, but I'm going to wrap it up now. I just want to ask Tom, you know, and I'll, and I'll post the link to where people can buy this book. And someone on the chat says she's a few chapters in Liv. She says she's a few chapters in in loving your book. Um, oh, so that, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Very and nice. um, yeah, it, it is a great book. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so please do um, have a look if you're interested. Like I said, I'll post the link. Um, so just quickly to end off, Tom, can you tell us what's next um, for you? OK. Um, so I'm writing a novel at the moment. Um, and uh, I won't give too many details away. But um, I, I, I've actually I've only ever written one novel before this and it's I've never sought publication of that particular novel. But that I don't want to give too much away, but that novel that I have finished and may one day dare to stick it in front of a publisher's nose um, and beg is um, a novel that was set in Chicago, actually, one of the islands I was telling you about those those misty valleys. So that's but no, at the moment, I'm writing a novel set um, around Salisbury. Um, in uh, my dear old Wiltshire, um, a, and it's set in the 90s, which is an era that I pine for when I look at uh, the way we live today, um, for various reasons. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm writing a novel about a group of uh, teenage boys who are living um, in, in, a, in, in a, a few little villages around Salisbury in the 90s, and they get themselves in a little spot of bother. Um, <laughs> it's being enormous fun writing it because it's taking me back to when I was a teenager in the 90s. And um, I, that's sort of why I decided to write it because they do say write about what you know. Um, and I thought, well, I've written about my experiences in Japan. What else do I know? Well, I know what it's like to grow up in the 90s in, in, in Wiltshire um, and I'm hoping yeah, I mean, I, I don't know when I'll be finished, but, you know, I'm hoping that maybe that might see the light of day in paper form in 2022 or 2023, you never know. But um, uh, just to let people know where they can get my book, Can Coffee and Kimonos, um, uh, I've had a few messages recently saying, is it available as an audio book? It's not, I'm afraid, but that's something I'm working on. So fingers crossed. But you can find my book on... Amazon, WH Smith Online, Waterstones, uh, and it's also available as an ebook as well if you prefer to read ebooks on Kindles or things like that. So it's Canned Coffee and Kimonos by Tom Fitzmorris. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. I can't no, wait to read you. the rest. Um, and yeah. Uh, look forward to hearing more about your upcoming works and your, your book set in Wiltshire. Um, but thanks for sharing that. It's fascinating. Like I said, we could have probably talked for hours tonight. Um, yeah. But if anyone wants to get in contact with Tom, um, hopefully that's okay, Tom, if they have any questions. Um, Absolutely. I'm always yeah. happy to speak. Great. I'll share your page as well, your, your book Brilliant. page. And um, yeah, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, and I look forward to speaking to you again, Tom. All right. Have a great evening, Thank everyone. You so Thank you. Okay. I've